Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Have you ever been considering buying something? And someone, a salesperson or perhaps a friend, they begin to tell you about this product or perhaps this vacation spot, whatever it might be. And you hear things and you think how wonderful this will be. So you buy that product, you go to that spot on vacation, whatever it might be, and you experience it and you find out something. What you have been told is very different than the literal experience, the reality of the situation. Now, that happens throughout life, but it should not be the experience when we study God's Word. And what I mean is this. We shouldn't be told something about a passage of Scripture. And then after studying it thoroughly, finding out what we have been told about it, how magnificent, how wonderful, how unique, how special, well, it's really not. There are numerous other passages like this that says the same thing. And that's exactly the problem I have with many people who falsely, who incorrectly speak about the last part of Isaiah chapter 19. Now, we began two weeks ago studying this 19th chapter. We saw in our first session, we learned from chapter 19, verse 1 through verse 15. And we've seen that primarily this chapter, at least the first two-thirds, speak of judgment, a burden upon Egypt where God is judging and destroying this nation. We have seen, however, in our second session, which is an introduction to the second half of this chapter, we've seen and encountered what others have said concerning this prophecy, that it's unique, that it contains the most wonderful miracle ever. And it talks about how there's going to be healing of Abraham's family, a reunion between the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Isaac, the descendants of Esau, the descendants of Jacob, one big happy family, reunification, one of the greatest stories. Well, the problem is, as we're going to see when we study this section, this is not the case. Now, is it a wonderful prophecy? Yes. It confirms, it reveals to us the faithfulness of God. What God told to Abraham in that covenant, he is going to fulfill. There's going to be a kingdom established. But let's be careful. Many of the prophets, they spoke similarly. All the prophets spoke about a kingdom that was coming and that God would be faithful to carry it out, that there would be judgment and that judgment would produce victory for the people of God. So this prophecy is not unique. It is not greater, more sensational than many other prophecies dealing with the same subject. Yes, it tells us about unity, unity between prophetic truth and reality. Now, what I want us to do is to open up our Bibles, go to where we left off, Isaiah chapter 19 and verse 16. And I want us to realize something. Now, I've taught at Bible colleges and seminaries in the past. 
And if I were giving an assignment to a group of students about this section, this passage of Scripture, verses 16 through 25 of Isaiah chapter 19, the first thing that I would say is to read carefully, thoroughly, and repeatedly these verses. Then I would say, tell me what stands out grammatically. What is unique from a language standpoint? And there's one primary answer. Look with me to verse 16. Now, this passage opens up, verses 16 through 25, it opens up with the phrase, Beyom ha hu, on that day. If you were to have read this as I asked thoroughly, I hope you know something. And that is that that phrase repeats exactly the same way six times in these ten verses. That is significant. Plus, the phrase, Beyom Hahu, on that day, is a significant passage or phrase. We find that it refers to judgment. God's judgment that usually tells us that we're speaking about something in the last days. God's judgment that is going to produce the kingdom. And that's certainly the, the outcome here when we look at verse 16, verse 18, verse 19, verse 21, verse 23, verse 24. All these verses that I gave you, six times we see that expression, the Yom Hahu. It tells us that judgment is being proclaimed, but there's going to be a kingdom outcome. Now, going back to my question, I would ask the students what stands out here in this passage, and I hope that they would say, Beyom Hahu, on that day, it's repeated over and over six times in ten verses. Then the second question I would ask, what are some likely reasons for that? Beyond just judgment, beyond end day's significance. And when we look at the end of this passage, we see that there's an emphasis between Israel, Egypt, and Assyria. And if I were to tell most biblical students, Egypt, Assyria, and Israel, what comes into your mind? Well, I hope that the answer would be this. God told Abraham in a very important passage. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 18. He says that the borders of the land, that promised land that he took an oath to give to Abraham and his descendants, meaning Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the children of Jacob, that promised land had to do with a geographical border. Let's look at that verse very quickly. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 18. Again, Genesis 15 and verse 18. Now, when we look at it, something stands out. Because it begins, and I want to read this in Hebrew. It says, Beyom ha hu. Now, I hope you see. The same way that in chapter 19, verses 16 through 25, six times that phrase appears, Beyom hahu. When we look at chapter 15, verse 18, it begins with that phrase, Beyom hahu. That ties together these two passages. Now, here, if we translate it, it simply says, look again at verse 18, on that day the Lord cut a covenant with Avram. So you'd say, now, wait. It means on that day, going back 4,000 years. It's not futuristic. It is. This is the key of good Bible study. Because Beyom Hahu, although it may be speaking about on that day in the past, that phrase points to last day's implications. 
And if we read it all, look again, verse 18. On that day, the Lord cut a covenant with Avram, saying, to your seed. So we have a future implication. To your seed, I will give the land, this land. Now, literally, it's not I will give, but I have given. It's in the past tense. So God has already made a decision. That to your seed, I have given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the Euphrates, Nahar Parat, the Euphrates River. So what does this passage tell us? Well, it deals with Abrahamic's covenant that includes that there's an emphasis upon the land. Anyone who is a student of the Bible and is focusing in on prophecy the last days and does not emphasize the significance of the land in that future, in the last days, that is a false teacher. Land is of the utmost importance to God in the past, today, and especially in the future. This prophecy has not been fulfilled. When God says, I have made a covenant with Abraham, that to your seed, and there's connection between that word seed and Messiah, meaning this, the people of Messiah. I have given this land. The land from the river in Egypt, this is, in my opinion, the Nile, all the way unto the great river, the Euphrates River, which is in the empire of Assyria. So we see the borders of the land from a kingdom standpoint, from the promise of the covenant, Abraham's covenant. The borders of Israel will be from Egypt unto Assyria. This is very important. Has that happened yet? No, it has not. Will it happen? Yes, and we know that. Because God has promised. And now we see the fulfillment of that. Now, is that wonderful news? Yes, it is. Is it surprising news? No, God has promised. Now we just simply see Isaiah confirming once again that God hasn't changed his mind. He hasn't forgotten his covenant obligations. God will do it. How is he going to do it? We'll keep reading. Back to chapter 19 and verse 16. On that day, Egypt will be as women. Now, what's it speaking here? Well, women, there is a emphasis on fear and trembling. Women, by and large, are, are easier scared than men. So it says, on that day, Egypt will be like women and trembling And fear because of what? Because the Lord of hosts, the waving or the shaking of his hand, the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he will wave concerning him. Now, this is simply a a way of saying that God is waving his hand, and the implication here is in a threatening manner. It goes along with what we've said, that there's going to be judgment and destruction in Egypt. So now it's getting ready to be realized. Verse 17, we read, And the land, and this is the word ground, Adama, the ground of Judah will be to Egypt before a terror. It literally says the ground of Judah will become a terror to Egypt. Why is that? Because Egypt is going to see God moving to deliver Israel, to keep covenant with Israel, and therefore to judge the enemies of Israel. And initially, Even in the last days, and especially Egypt, for a time period, will be an enemy of 
Israel. And therefore, God is proclaiming judgment as we've seen in the first 15 verses that still continues now. So once again, the ground of Judah will become to Egypt for a terror. And all who reminds it unto him, everyone who makes mention of Judah, this will be a fear. It will cause panic among the inhabitants of Egypt. It says that he will fear, that is Egypt, because of the counsel of the Lord of hosts. So we see how God is being spoken of as a Lord of hosts and his counsel, this is what he has proclaimed. This word in this context is related to a synonym for prophecy. What God has counseled is what he has proclaimed he is going to do. And now there is evidence that that's going to come about. And that's why Egypt is full of fear and trembling because of this. Because he has counseled what he has counseled unto him or concerning him. What is that? This judgment upon Egypt. Look now to verse 18. We have the second time. Beyom hahu. On that day, here again, God's judgment is falling. It is a end time contextual aid. On that day, there will be five cities in the land of Egypt. And these five cities, there's something unique about them. It says, speaking, spot the language of Canaan, Canaan. Now, most rabbinical commentators classify this language of Canaan as the Hebrew language. I have no problem with that. But the, land, the, the word Canaan comes from the Hebrew word, which is, is to submit. It is to recognize authority and respond properly. And first and foremost, this is what this five cities are going to be doing. They're going to be recognizing the authority of God, the God of Israel. And they are going to swear, meaning take an oath to the Lord of hosts. They're going to do so in the midst of what? Well, it says here, a city of destruction. Now, some will have, in fact, probably a third of the translations in English has a sun city. This is incorrect. It's simply Harris, which is destruction. Many of your translations have that correctly. A city of destruction will be said to one. And the implication is this. If they submit to God, they're going to be destroyed. It is the Egyptians threatening these five cities. If any one of you do that, you will be destroyed. So there is persecution, threaten against these five cities that want to submit to the Lord. Look now to verse 19. The third time. On that day, Beyom Hahu, there will be a altar unto the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt. Now, what is this saying? Well, an altar is for sacrifice. It means here that in the center of Egypt, there is going to be those who want to offer, submit to, live sacrificially for God. So an altar unto the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and also a, a pillar. Now, this is a, a sacred, a holy structure at the border unto the Lord. So in the midst of the city or the nation and also at the border, presumably the border between Egypt and Israel, there's going to be a structure that testifies to a remnant of Egypt that wants to submit, wants to worship, wants to be part of God's covenantal people. Verse 20. 
and it shall come about. This should be for a sign. Now, remember, this word sign, oat. It speaks about something that is miraculous that only God can do. And it's to tell us that it speaks of God miraculously redeeming a remnant of Egypt. That they're going to be responsive. So there's a, a sign and, notice, testimony. When God works miraculously in a person's life, there's an outcome, a visible outcome. That person gives testimony. So we see a normative experience. God moves to redeem this remnant in Egypt. Now, notice it said five cities. Five is the number for incomplete. What it's speaking about, not all of Egypt, but a remnant of Egypt is going to make this decision. So there will be, verse 20, for a miraculous sign and for testimony unto the Lord of hosts, meaning unto him because of him in the land of Egypt. For they will cry out unto the Lord because of what? Because of their oppressors. This is the one for putting stress, anxiety upon another. So these who are testifying it is going to cause them like every place else in the world in the last days to be persecuted for their faith but notice the faithfulness of god verse 20 second part for they will cry out unto the lord because of their oppressors or afflictors and he will send to them who's that god god will send to them moshia now moshia you know a little bit of Hebrew, you probably know this word. It comes from the same root as the name Yeshua, Jesus. It comes from the same root for the term salvation. Now, this is for the phrase to save. Moshe is the one who saves. So what's he doing? Because of their faithfulness, their testimony, because that they belong to him, what is he going to do? In the midst of this persecution, it says that he is going to send for them a Savior who is mighty and who will save them. Now, this is the remnant. Remember, the emphasis upon those five cities to teach us not all of Egypt. There's no national salvation, but it's simply speaking about a remnant. Verse 21. And the Lord will be known to Egypt. And Egypt will know the Lord. So the Lord is going to be known to Egypt. And Egypt will know the Lord. So the Lord knows Egypt. Egypt knows the Lord. When? Beyom Hahu. The fourth time this is mentioned. And notice because of the Savior and his mighty work and him saving them, they come to a experiential knowledge of God. When we look at verse 21, the Lord is known to Egypt. This word for known is not a cognitive one. It is an experiential one. They are going to experience the Lord on that day. And then we find second part of verse 21, and they shall serve a sacrifice and an offering and a vow they will pay into the Lord and they will pay in full. This speaks about what? Having been saved, experiencing God, they are going to want to make sacrifice and offerings unto him and that we see here they will make a commitment, a vow, and they will pay them. They'll make a vow and they'll pay what they have vowed. It speaks about faithfulness of this remnant of Egypt, that they're going to have the right experience, the right testimony. Verse 22, and the Lord in the midst of their deliverance, what is he going to do? The Lord will strike, and this means to strike with a plague, Egypt. He will strike them, they will be struck, but there's going to be healing. And they will return unto the Lord 
and the Lord will be entreated to them and he will heal them. Now, this is that remnant. They are going to have an influence greater than themselves. And that remnant is going to grow. There's going to be, because of God's striking them, there's going to be repentance. He is going to heal that land, bring about a change. When he's going to do that, look at verse 23. The fifth time we see Beyom Hahu. Now we're getting into the, the last three verses, those key verses that we saw in our previous study on an introduction to Isaiah 19, part 2. We saw how it's these last three verses that uh, Mike Bickle emphasized. And he made very large statements about them. Let's look at what they literally say. And do they confirm his uh, uh, conjectures? Verse 23. On that day, there shall be Mesila, a road. Now, this is a pathway. It's the same word for a runway at an airport. And here's the po point here. This word is usually for the purpose of connecting two locations. It's used elsewhere in Isaiah. We'll see that later on when it speaks about a, a highway unto the Lord, that the righteous, the redeemed, will travel on it. So it's about getting to him. It's a, a phrase of unification. Now, this word simply is the pathway, but when we look at it in context, it speaks about arriving at some place. Verse 23. On that day, there shall be a road from Egypt to Assyria. Now, this is the first time that Assyria is being mentioned. And the emphasis here is not the people, but the geographical area. From Egypt in the south to Assyria in the north. It is to unite. Why? Well, remember. Beyom Hahu. Over and over. And when we look at God's covenantal promise to Abraham, to his descendants, gives us a futuristic, even though God has given it in the past, he's proclaimed that it's going to happen in the future. When? In the midst of judgment. And that judgment is going to give birth to a greater Israel that will be including parts of Egypt and parts of Assyria. Just like we've been told in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 18. Again, verse 23. And on that day, there shall be a way, a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And shall come Assyria with Egypt and Egypt with Assyria. Meaning, that they're going to have something in common. They're going to use that to come. To come where and for what purpose? Well, we see here that within the kingdom borders, and what's the main characteristic of that kingdom? When God establishes his kingdom, it's a kingdom of righteousness, holiness, and worship. Worship is key in the millennial kingdom. It should be at the foundation of our lives now. But when we look here at verse 23, it says, And Assyria will come with Egypt. And the word come here is in the singular, which emphasizes unity between those two people. They become one people. And Egypt with Assyria. And what are they going to do? What's the purpose of this road? That they will worship Egypt Will, will worship with Assyria, meaning that they are going to worship the Lord God, the God of Israel. They're coming for the purpose of worship, to serve God. So Egypt with Assyria are going to serve, they're going to worship. Verse 24. Now, this is good. It speaks about a fulfillment, that God is going to set up a kingdom, and in that kingdom, 
in these geographical locations, people are going to worship. Does it speak about a national salvation for Egypt and a national salvation for Assyria? Syria is not a nation. It's an empire. The emphasis is on the borders of Israel being a place of worship. And all who's there, both Jew and Gentile, are going to worship the Lord God in Messiah Yeshua. Verse 24. Here we have the sixth time. Beyom hahu. On that day, Israel will be a shlishia. What is that? Shlishia is kind of a three pack. Now, the number three is for the purpose of revealing something, documenting something. And in that day, through God's judgment that establishes a kingdom reality, Israel is going to reveal something. And it says here that Israel is going to be a three-pack with Egypt and Assyria. Is it speaking about the Arabs? No, it's speaking primarily about the land there. Now, does that mean that God's against the Arab people? Absolutely not. God's desire is that Israel would be used to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. But simply what it's saying here is that God's faithfulness to establish his borders as he promised to Abraham, it's going to be manifested. It speaks about God's faithfulness. God keeps his covenantal promise. That's what we should learn. From, from this verse, verse 24, God's judgment is going to bring about the fulfillment of his co uh, covenantal purposes, his covenantal promises between Israel, which will be extended all the way to the river of Egypt and to the river, that great river of Assyria, the Euphrates. And what's the purpose of that? Well, notice it says a blessing will be in the midst of the land. Now, this is important because if you were to ask, what is God's desire for this Abrahamic covenant? Well, if you go back to Genesis 12, it says that God wants this people to be a blessing. So this is further textual evidence, scriptural evidence, what this is about. God is promising here. He's revealing that God is going to strike Egypt severely. He is going to bring judgment and destruction. Most of the people are not going to respond to him. Not a national salvation. Assyria is mentioned. Why is Assyria mentioned? Because of the land, the borders. That's the only say that said that the, the only thing that's said here. That it will be used, this highway between these two locations, and when we think of Egypt and Assyria, obviously we need to think about Genesis 15, 18. That the kingdom is going to be a kingdom of worship, and people will travel throughout the borders of this promised land to worship God. Where? In Jerusalem. That's the key here. And what is the chief characteristic of this kingdom? I said it's a kingdom of holiness, righteousness, worship will be going on, but all of this is for the purpose of manifesting the blessing of God. And as I said, when you look at Abrahamic covenant, you will find that it says, and through you, speaking about Israel, this, this fulfilled nation, this obedient nation that will eventually come about, that's a last day promise. It says, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's what we're speaking about here, a blessing from those families who are what? Part of the kingdom experience. Verse 25. Now, in case someone didn't see the emphasis of a blessing in verse 24, it's repeated. Look now to our last verse, verse 25. Speaking about the Lord, it says, which the Lord will bless. The Lord of hosts will bless, saying, blessed are my people Egypt, the work of my hand Assyria, and my inheritance Israel. So through what Israel inherits Egypt, and what is Egypt? 
being spoken of here, usually prophetically, Egypt is spoken of as representing the world. He's speaking about Egypt as personifying the people of the world, the nations, that God through Israel's inheritance, that the people of the world through God's covenantal promise to Abraham can be blessed. And notice it says, the work of my hand, Assyria. It speaks about how God takes these two destinations. Those who were once enemies, Egypt and Assyria. Remember that Assyria, when the first exile, now we need to hear this carefully. In one sense, Egypt represents the first exile. But the people went down there willfully and were enslaved. What's unique about the second one, and this is the first time they're taken captive, this is by Assyria. And the Assyria, if you look at Ezekiel, we are told that that Assyrian exile doesn't end until the last days. And what God is saying here when it says, Ma'ase Yadi, the work of my hand, God is going to take that which represents captivity, that which represents exile, and he is going to change it into what? A blessing. Nowhere should we come away, no scriptural reason to say, this speaks about the healing of the Middle East problem between Jew and Arab in some unique way. Now, of course, that problem is going to be solved. But the problem is not unique between Jew and Arab. It is a problem between humanity and God. Israel received the covenant to proclaim that covenant in order for all the nations to be saved. All who would humble themselves, it's going to be a remnant, but all who humble themselves and accept Messiah Yeshua through the gospel. So let's not take this prophecy and talk about a healing of Abraham's family and praise Esau and Ishmael. The word of God doesn't do that. God bless Ishmael, but we don't see anything being spoken of here. Ishmael. Not so much spoken of in regard to Assyria. That's taking it out of the context. Ishmael was blessed in this world. Hopefully that recognition that God blessed him in this world and he became a mighty person might cause him to submit to the God of Israel and receive the right plan, which is that Israel is God's chosen nation and to support join, submit to the purposes of God. But speaking about healing of Abraham's family and putting this in context to the Arab world, all of this is taking a passage, ripping it away, wanting to make it sensational for drawing headlines, drawing attention rather than being true to the text. Very important that each person that approaches the word of God does so, does so wanting to be faithful, to demonstrate fidelity to what the word of God says and not take it beyond and misappropriate prophecy because it makes their interpretation cessation. That's not what we're called to do. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.